seem to be working very fast now in Egypt, as, as, at least for the uh, issue of pet. So all of us should really know now that pet is very, very important in medicine in general. And it has played a major role over the last 20 years, particularly in oncology. And it is now an essential tool in the management of a wide range of diseases. In particular, lymphoma, which we were just listening about how therapy with sebalin can do uh, better. Obviously, the uh, workup nowadays, uh, rather than gallium-67, is usually PET. And I hope that uh, this takes place because gallium is a very rough agent which belongs to the old times. And uh, things are moving forward in the right direction. Obviously also melanoma and uh, bronchial carcinoma with the exception of alveolar cell carcinoma. We also worked a lot on colorectal cancers and other cancers. Uh, there are some limitations for uh, FTG which we will talk about. There is quite a big field for um, PET in cardiology and neuropsychiatry, but this hasn't really been utilized effectively and I doubt if it's going to be utilized. Uh, for various reasons. So PET, mainly 95% of cases uh, have been using um, FDG for the assessment of oncology, which so far is so good. But these all depend on FDG and the FDG has got some drawbacks. The fluorine part of the FDG, we all know that FDG is a glucose, it's labeled with, with fluorine and the glucose goes to wherever there is increased metabolism and therefore cancer is the first station or step. But it also goes to areas which has large um, degree of inflammation uh, because of the increased metabolism there. So fluorine 18 is difficult to label, for example, amino acids and antibodies, and uh, this makes it a little bit limited in its use. It has got low sensitivity in certain tumors, such as alveolar cell carcinoma and uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and also it may miss tumors that are close to normal physiological structures, such as the bladder and the brain, and so on. So the answer is to use carbon-11, for example, if one needs to use a cyclotron um, in order to bypass the fluorine-18 problem. And also to use fluorine-18, but to label other products rather than glucose uh, in order to bypass the problem with the reduced sensitivity and specificity. Obviously, the cyclotrons have got their own drawbacks, and as some of you know very well, sometimes the price of the cyclotron is actually much more expensive than the price of the pet machine itself. And also the delivery from cyclotrons, because normally it is, or should be on site, but if it is off site, and nowadays in big capitals, the delivery is quite a difficult thing, uh, particularly in large cities and metropolis. So um, one has to confine to a certain time limit and schedule in order to obey the rules. And the answer for that, for the transport problems and for the lack of the cyclotron, obviously, is to move on to the gallium generator. And this is the gallium-68. It's different from gallium-67. It has nothing to do with gallium-67. And most of the talk of today will be concentrated actually on uh, carbon-11, but also the majority is going to be about gallium-68. So we have uh, actually worked on different varieties of uh, pet tracers, apart from fluorine 18 FTG. We've worked on FLT, uh, which is finally in lung cancer, to see the metabolism, because this is a, um, a tracer that looks at proliferation and DNA activity. We've also worked on dopamine uh, in, in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, on DOPA labeled to uh, fluorine 18. And then recently we started to work on carbon-11 uh, simply because we have the cyclotron close to us and we use carbon-11, choline and methionine and acetate in a variety of prostate cancer. The problem obviously with the carbon is the short half-life, which is quite non-practical unless if you have it next door to you. If this is overcome, then the results are fantastic. And then we moved on to the gallium-68 generator. And this is a fantastic development in the field of PET because you could use it for more than a year. You elude it, elude 
the generator in your department. Cost effectively is fantastic because if you use it for a large number of patients, you will actually um, save money, uh, although the starting price probably is high. Currently, the generator is about $15,000. Uh, maybe it has gone up a little bit in the recent uh, days or months, but if one uses this for one year for different things rather than your endocrine tumor, as we will talk later, it is quite cost effective. So we'll start with the carbon 11 choline, which we have been using um, recently in the uh, detection of prostate cancer. And those of you who use PET uh, FTG know that prostate cancer is not a cancer which lends itself well to the um, FDG because FDG accumulates in the bladder. Just like any other tracer that we use, most of our studies end up having a very prominent bladder. For the, car for the carbon 11 choline, uh, it has, first of all, a high affinity for prostate cancer. And there is something very interesting with the choline in that there is a late urinary excretion. So it stays in the kidney rather than to go to the bladder and fast uh, succession as happens with the FDG and this will pick up the tumor. So if I show you this, the first impression that people like us usually say is that oh yes, this is PCR, this is the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, the bladder. But hang on a minute, this is not the bladder. It's not the bladder. Actually the bladder is here. This is the prostate cancer. So when done in the early time, it picks up the cancer of the prostate before the tracer is actually in the bladder. And this is obviously a low um, slice CT just to see where we are. And it's clearly an advantage to see this, the two sides and also the bladder full up with water, but not with radioactive urine, until later on when it comes down. So carbon coding uh, is now quite an attractive agent to look at the prostate. Although I must say that mostly we use it for research purposes, but then FTG came as a research agent and then it became part of our clinical practice. So things move on from the animal work into the uh, clinical side very, very rapidly. So I'm going to show you some of our cases of choline uh, carbon-11. This is a, a case of a 79-year-old gentleman who was uh, diagnosed with carcinoma of the prostate and I would like you to have a look at this, the resolution of this little lymph node. Now, I know this is a, if there is a radiologist with us, they will say, obviously we can pick it up on the CT, uh, but this is not a good quality CT. In fact, you could see it here. But as we all know, in CT, the size makes a lot of difference, which is quite the nonsense because uh, the lymph node should be above 10 millimeters to be considered as malignant and below that is benign. And I wonder what would they say for a 9.5 millimeter lymph node? Because things start being small and then they grow up. So you cannot really judge the virulence of the disease by the size of the tumor. So this is a lymph node which would look here like uh, quite a small lymph node, but in fact it's quite a, an aggressive lymph node that needs to be treated. And obviously we know exactly what happens here the staging of the disease changes and the therapy approach and the management of the patient will definitely change. This is another example of a patient uh, slightly younger with PSA of 22, uh, received radiotherapy and then look at the carbon choline scan and look at all these lymph nodes in the groin and you can see them here with the PET-CT um, actually quite active lymph nodes that will obviously change the management of this patient. This is another man, another patient with uh, prostate cancer following prostatectomy in 2004. And what is interesting in this patient is that if we look at our old, good old bone scan, you could see that there is here a lesion in the pelvis on the right side. But on the carbon 11, you could pick that up easily. And also there is a lesion, uh, obviously, uh, in a different location involving this rib here on the CT. So in addition to the lesion you see on the bone scan, which we still believe is the best in detecting bony metastasis uh, from prostate cancer, there is room to try and see if other agents can actually pick up things. And this is a good example of how uh, bone scan may have some limitations. 
This is another example which I personally um, find very interesting because we always come across a bone scan for a patient with CA prostate and having a history or an associated Paget's disease. And sometimes you see the lesion and you think, is this purely like Paget's disease? Is it a possibility that there is an existing uh, side of, of uh, extension of the disease? And this is one of those examples. You can see the uptake in this hemi pelvis, quite an intense uptake, which is very much similar to what we see in Paget's disease. But to be on the safe side, I would always say in my report, usually uh, just in case something happens, I would say, okay, this looks like Paget's disease, but the possibility of a coexisting small lesion cannot be ruled out. And I don't like myself for seeing this because, you know, you, you are sitting on the fence putting one leg here and one foot here and, and saying these things. But with the carbon, uh, you could see clearly that the, the activity, I actually ran out of both uh, laser pointers, the activity is clearly uh, that of Paget's disease. There is no uptake in the uh, lesion to suggest things happen. Thank you very much. So if we move on to carbon 11 methionine, this is another amino acid, and uh, this is, has found its use uh, following complex surgery for brain tumors. Uh, CT and MR are quite all right, uh, but they cannot differentiate if there is a post-surgical fibrosis or post-radiotherapy changes. And the brain has high physiological uptake of FDG, that's why we don't see small lesions in the brain using FDG, because FDG normally goes to normal liver structure, uh, brain structure. So it is difficult to detect that. And carbon-11 methionine has no physiological uptake, very limited, limited background activity. So anything unusual will shine out. And fibrosis and necrosis and edema will not show it. And I'll show you one example. So we use this basically uh, as a primary diagnosis, not really that much, because by the time the patients come to us, they have been diagnosed with CT or MR. But it is quite a, a good agent for assessment of relapse, and it's quite useful and should be done routinely. Another indication for it, which is well known for the last seven or eight years, is the use of methionine in primary hyperpolyphyroidism, when MIBI or other methods and the combination with ultrasound are not working. So this is an example of a patient who has got a primary diagnosis done by MR, which is suggesting that this is malignant, and obviously it is quite malignant, and these cases are all proved actually by histopathology and biopsy. And this is also a case of hyperparathyroidism, and we know that the MIBI that we use, the dual phase MIBI imaging, and some people still use the thallium technetium subtraction scan, have a limited sensitivity. In my opinion, the sensitivity is probably around 80, although the textbooks push it sometimes up to 85 or 90. And we end up sometimes having parathyroid uh, adenomas, which wash up very quickly, and when we look at it, we don't see anything, and you will report it as negative, which is a false negative scan. So having something uh, to aid this, particularly when other imaging has suggested that there is an adenoma, but you can't see it with the maybe, it comes very handy to have this as an aid in this respect. Acetate is another um, uh, tracer that is uh, labeled with carbon-11, and uh, its main indication is again for prostate cancer, uh, but also, which is very, very handy to help in hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, hepatocellular carcinoma is not viewed with FDG. And when I receive a request for hepatocellular carcinoma uh, imaging of the, uh, with PET, I actually refuse because the sensitivity is quite low and we might as well toss a coin and say, yes, it is there or no, it is not. So, it's not one of the indications for PET, we know that very well. And this is very helpful because it's again PET, but it is using a different agent with a higher sensitivity. Now this I borrowed uh, from one of the journal, Journal of Nuclear Medicine, and it's, it's a, a case of carbon-11 acetate PET compared to FDG in a hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's clearly not showing the tumor here, which is being missed by the FDG. This is one of our cases in which there is a carbon-11, uh, this is a carbon-11 PET in a case of metastases in hepatocellular carcinoma. This is the FDG which looks fine and if you look at the liver, although maybe the sections are not representative, 
the liver is slightly patchy, but we cannot really uh, see anything there. The rest of the scan is not really that much attractive. There might be a little bit of activity here, but it's very clear that on the acetate there are various lesions involving the bones which are definitely metastatic. So these three traces that are uh, linked to the carbon 11 are very powerful with specific indications and I would imagine that they will come into the clinical uh, uh, practice and applications within a few years. Back to fluorine T, um, in addition to the FDG which we use very, very routinely, there are other agents, one of them is fluorine dopa. And this is a phenylalanine uh, derivative which is available, which is uh, an amino acid and uh, the precursor of dopamine which is used in uh, Parkinson's disease imaging and we have been using it for quite some time. But it has been used in the detection of other tumors such as malignant neuronuclein tumors. These are very well differentiated, slow growing tumors and they don't show clearly on the FTG scans. So it can actually compensate for some of the low resolution of octreotide imaging that we see and uh, I have one or two examples here. This is one of our patients. I was a little bit disappointed when I did this scan because when I saw this I didn't know what to call it but then we compared it with the, with the CT and we realized that there is dopa uptake in the normal pancreas which can be a problem especially that we know that neuroendocrine tumors that like the pancreas and they go and actually quite a large number of them develop in the pancreas. But there is a way of differentiating that a tumor from the normal uptake or basically based on the SUV and the uptake value. And the gold value sometimes shows which is a normal variant so one has to be very careful. But the bony lesion is picked up so easily and so nicely uh, with the dopa. So it has its use Unfortunately, it's not available, for example, in the United Kingdom. And only six months ago, I had a patient who was uh, having a medullary carcinoma, which is one of the indications for the fluorine uh, uh, 18 uh, dopa. And we had to send the patient to Germany to have the scan. So um, I was thinking maybe countries who have now are in the process of buying cyclotrons may be more advantageous than in our situation because we ended up not having the ability to, to do all these scans but having a limited range but perhaps countries like Egypt could actually take into consideration that there is a wide range of things other than FDG and one has to uh, make sure that one can do these things. This is a dopa uh, fluorine 18 and a well differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumor and just, just to compare the uptake on octreotide scan which looks perfectly okay and the uptake on the dopa scan which shows the metastasis. So there is clearly a difference in the uptake of the two agents. There was a noise about FRT in the beginning of the, uh, this decade and actually in 2001 it was hailed as the heir to the uh, FDG. People were saying FDG is going to go and FLT will take it. But it was quite disappointing and if you look at the literature you see that many people have done work on FLT and this is timely and uh, it wasn't really very good. The uptake in the tumor is sometimes not very satisfactory and you have to increase the threshold in order to see it with your own eyes. Uh, SUV was also very very low. We're talking about an SUV of 0.1 and 0.2 when well, normally we have the SUV of the FDG in the region of 2 to 3 as a normal. Um, it doesn't accumulate in inflammation which could be an advantage and could be used in that respect to separate uptake or the differential diagnosis of malignancy and inflammation. This is an example of the study that we did. We investigated the uptake of FLT in brain tumors as metastases from the bronchial carcinoma. And this is the FDG and this is the FLT and we, we all agree now that it is very clear on the FDG so why bother, why do the FLT? But in fact the tumour here is quite intense and if it was here on the normal uptake of the FDG you might have missed it if it was uh, very low uptake. But the beauty, the only beauty in my opinion about the FLT is that there is nothing in the brain, no uptake apart from the uptake of the 
pregnancy, which could be a point for the future. This is a new paper in 2008 uh, by Herman from the German Nuclear, Med German Nuclear Medicine talking about how to differentiate between uh, pancreatic cancer and pancreatitis based on histology uh, using FLT which shows the uh, uptake in the malignant tissue but not in the inflammatory tissue, which could be a good point to start with FLT again. So the last issue that I'm going to talk to you about is the gallium-68, which is my preferred subject. And this is, uh, in a way, my baby, because I started this in the United Kingdom uh, as the first hospital at the Hammersmith to do this uh, when it was only available in Germany. Uh, gallium has got very attractive qualities. The, obviously, it's a pet uh, tracer. It has got a half-life of 68 minutes. It's just about enough to do your imaging. We image up to 30 to 40 minutes. It's produced by a germanium gallium generator, which lives for a long time. It, it, the half-life is 271 days. So practically, you could lose it uh, for more than a year. And some people are using it for almost 15 months. It is well established. The chemistry is, well, is, is very good, and it can label uh, quite a large number of particles, including amino acids and so on. And some of the images that I'm going to show you are really very good. And, uh, some of them, actually, when I did some talks and showed these images, they were requested from me to put on books and chapters and also in journals because the quality of the gallium is really, in my opinion, breathtaking. So, I don't know what happened to my slides here, but I haven't done this before. So, uh, it must be the formatting because sometimes I do my slides on the Macintosh and when it goes to the PC, it just goes mad. So, uh, the don't at all are the new ligands which link to the tracers. They are replacing the octotype that we know of. And there are new agents that are being used in the industry. Uh, they are much better as far as attachment to water is concerned with increased ingredient elimination. They bind, for example, the don't at all binds only to receptor number two out of the five receptors. But nevertheless, the affinity for that receptor is so high that it shows the tumor without showing anything else. So gallium was attached to the dota talk, and uh, the activity of the tumor is seen very, very clearly within a short period of time. Um, I'll show you some examples rather than to explain it, but this is from Hoffman, and Hoffman was the first person to publish results of the gallium and neuronuclear tumors in 2001. Uh, and they work in, in, in an establishment in Germany, in uh, Munich. So these are the time window that we have between the uptake of the tumor and the declining activity in the kidney and the general background. So we do image uh, uh, at this particular uh, time limit. And we have done by far roughly about 50 patients. Uh, with gallium 68, mostly neuroendocrine tumors, but also pheochromocytomas and medullary thyroid carcinoma, which uh, from the previous uh, speaker is a notorious tumor, very fascinating uh, in association with men, but very notorious sometimes in control. The dose is much less than the dose we use for the FDG, which in our case we use 400 megabex, so in this case we use less than half of that dose. We image up to 40 minutes, and we have found excellent, exquisite quantity and quality of images. It detects a larger number of tumors, and it has a very high tumor to background ratio compared to octreotide and MIBG. We are currently working on, um, I don't know if Sharif uh, if is here or not, but uh, one of your colleagues has actually worked on uh, a paper that we are presenting to look at the difference between uptake uh, with gallium and MIBG and we found that there is no lesion that is seen on the gallium that is uh, on the MIBG that is not seen on the on the gallium 68. On the other hand there are quite a lot of lesions that are seen on the gallium which are not seen on the, on the MIBG. So in my opinion, this is the real king. This is the king of the future for uh, PET imaging, particularly for patients who don't have access or facilities with the cyclotron. And you may ask, how could people actually buy a PET machine without cyclotron? There are 
And one example uh, is actually Croatia, which I visited to assess their pet system. And Croatians buy their FTG from neighboring country, from uh, uh, Austria. So it is quite a, a useful thing to have. These are the papers that we have published about the gallium and its use. And these are some of our examples. This is a normal distribution. This is a patient who has a kind of paraganglioma with clearly large tumor on the CT, but nothing on the MIBG and nothing on the octreotide. And this is the tumor on the FDG, but the tumor on the, on the dotatop is well separated from the kidneys, which I think is an advantage because there is no activity uh, in the kidney that is not really well circumscribed. I'll show you another example uh, of a patient who has got an octreotide, and you probably remember these cases where you, you are not sure, you know that there is something here, but uh, obviously you do spec to see that, but with the gallium you could detect a large number of tumors in uh, the liver, which are clearly an advantage. Another case uh, of a patient with carcinoid and liver metastasis, again not very clear on planar, I agree, uh, but on the gallium you could see them crispy, very nice. Uh, lesions that can be missed without the gallium. Uh, the last uh, case perhaps is a patient with paraganglioma and post bone metastasis seen on uh, CT. And we did the octreotide and it didn't show that much. We did an MIBG, showed a little bit of uptake here. This is a posterior view. So we did the usual MAC3 subtraction. We could see the adrenals, but there is only a small lesion here. And we wanted to compare this with the gallium. And the difference is really breathtaking because on the gallium you could see all those lesions. You discover lesion in the base of the skull which hasn't been discovered. You discover lymph nodes in the pelvis which haven't been seen in addition to all these lesions in the spine. Uh, this is another patient who has also multiple metastases from an octreotide, uh, from uh, a metastasis from a neuroendocrine tumor. And again, I wanted to show you how CT can actually miss quite a lot of lesions. These are all the lesions that are not well appreciated on the CT component, but seen on the PET. Uh, because gallium 68 can be done, as you know, as PET CT. And these are the other uh, lesions that can be missed in, the, in this patient. And the, the advantage of gallium 68 is that when you have it uh, positive, like in this patient, you could actually use lutetium-177 labeled with the same agent, with octreotide or with octreotide, and this will present, this is one of our cases, will present a massive improvement. It is being labeled with bombazine now for the detection of breast carcinomas, and uh, in summary, uh, we have been using FDG for quite some time, and uh, Although FDG is very, very helpful in the detection of malignancy, nowadays we feel that it has done its best and we need to move on to other agents because we want to fine-tune our uh, assessment of tumors. Thank you very much.